Well, hi folks, this is Darren with My RV Works. Today we have a water heater uh, we got called out on. Uh, it's an old Atwood water heater. Today those are Dometic water heaters. So I say that because Dometic bought Atwood. So if you're looking for some parts for your old Atwood water heater, you might find better luck looking for Dometic part numbers for that. So just file that away. This is a Dometic water heater. And uh, the customer states it works on electricity, but it is not working on LP, on gas mode. So let's dive in and follow the trail of 12 volts. If you've watched my other water heater videos, this one might be very similar to that. I've got my esteemed colleague with me, Dakota. Hello. We're going to troubleshoot this together. What? I said hello. Is that part of your script? Yeah. Okay, cool. So we are beautiful. It's where are we at? We're just out. We're west of Fort Angeles. Uh, the Elwha River is right past this tree line here. So if you're into kayaking or fishing, the, it's white water. I think it's class three, class four, class five. What class are you in? I'm in first class. Anyway, and we've got mountains behind us. There's eagles flying around. It is just stunningly, stunningly beautiful here. Uh, if you see my other video where we take you to Lake, Christ, Lake Crescent, that's just another two miles up the road. So this is a very beautiful place to be working out here. It's what, about 70 degrees? And in what month are we in? We're in August. It's about 70 degrees in August. So who brought a sweater? So let's go play with this water heater, follow the trail and see where it leads us. Well, here we are with our water heater. This is a GC6AA-10E. Not that that really matters when you're dealing with the principle of how these Atwood slash Dometic water heaters work. Okay, now this one has the option of running on either gas or electric. Follow with me on this. I've done a very detailed video on the Atwood water heater. So let me, let me do some housekeeping here. I'm gonna call this an Atwood water heater even though Dometic bought them uh, a couple years ago, but you're going to hear me interchange Dometic and Atwood, but for purposes of this video, I'm going to call this an Atwood. Or would it be better to call it a Dometic? What do you think, Dakota? All right, Atwood. just go with whatever I come up with. I have dyslexia, so if you've watched my videos, you know that I get words mixed up. So just love me through this process. Now, they all have this control board in the upper right-hand corner is my point, okay? Um, there's a lot of wires. Oh my gosh, all these wires, what do they do? My point is there's another video that I did where I go through what all these wires are going through. So I'm going to make a link on this bubble above my head because we learned how to do that. And I'm going to link to the other video where I explain all these wires. Okay. But since I've watched that video, I know where all these wires go. So I know that this top plug is going to be coming from my switch. So this water heater is dead in the water. It does not get any voltage at all voltage enters this circuit from the switch. So 12 volts is sitting on one side of the switch, just waiting to get to this water heater to do work. I'm going to have three wires on the top. I've got an orange, a white, and a brown. When I go on the inside and I flip my switch to gas, I'm going to put 12 volts on my orange wire. When I flip my switch to electric, I'm going to put 12 volts on my white wire. Okay, so these two wires, orange and white, are where the 12 volts is going to enter into this water heater system to turn it on on either of those two modes. It is possible to have both gas and electric on at the same time. That does not hurt the water heater to do that. Okay, so if you did that, then your switch would have 12 volts on the orange and you have 12 volts on the white. Orange being LP, white being AC. Okay, so this plug connects to my control module call it a DSI board, direct spark ignition board, or the, the ignition module, or the control board, or the motherboard. They go by a bunch of different names, but basically it's running the show. I run this into my, I'm going to call it a DSI board. This brown wire that comes out then is going to go down here, and I'm going to pick up the trail down there, but I'm going to plug this one back in. What I wanted to take away from this is that Power enters this water heater circuit through orange or white or both, okay? So we're going to plug that back in. Now, then I leave on my brown wire. Remember I had a brown wire? That brown wire is going to leave. It's going to come down here to this lower portion. The one on the right is going to be your thermostat. As long as I have continuity through this switch at the bottom, I'm going to call that a switch. It's a, it's a temperature switch. As long as I have continuity through that switch, then I'm going to come back I left my top brown wire. I'm going to go through my switch. I'm going to come back on my other brown wire and I'm going to go into the bottom plug. When I took this cover off and I was doing my initial assessment, I noticed that this water heater is missing something very important. It's missing the thermal fuse. The thermal fuse is they're about $18. They look like this. Um, and what this is, is 
that melts at a low temperature. And where that's supposed to go is right here. So I noticed that when I took this off. And so when you get your discerning eyeball on these things, you're going to realize that, hey, it's missing something. Now, a lot of times these will fail because why? A wasp nest or something made a nest inside of this burn chamber and flames came out of it or got hot and that trips this out. And what you might find is some people, they'll just take this out of the circuit and they'll just connect their brine wire back to the thermostat bypassing this thermal fuse. I would recommend not doing that. Pay your 18 bucks or whatever these things go for. I think they're like 18. Um, I have them for $18 and 19 cents is my price <clears throat> that I sell them for. But it's important because otherwise, how is this thing gonna know that there's a flame coming out of this? You've seen these black marks flying up the side of the RV and maybe it's because this happened and then they just bypassed it. So pay your 18 bucks, put your part on there. If you're gonna buy one, maybe buy two just to have, they're not that expensive. But the circuit's gonna leave here and it's gonna go through your thermostat. I think on these, um, they're set to about 140 degrees maybe 130, 140. We, we can look that up if it's necessary, but basically if the water heater is not satisfied, there should be continuity through the switch. It's a go, no go. Um, if I'm below 140, I'm using 140 as my example, then that should be closed. If I'm open, if I'm satisfied, then it'll be open. So you can't troubleshoot the water heater if the circuit is satisfied because the switch is open because he's satisfied. So you have to run your water to get the temperature cold inside your water heater so that the switch will close and you have can follow your trail. So basically then we're gonna come back up to the control board. If at that point we have selected AC as our heat source, which means I came in on my white wire, then I'm gonna energize, the control board in here is gonna energize this yellow wire and the yellow wire is gonna send 12 volts to the back side of the water heater and there's a relay back there. And the relay is controlling the 120 volts that's feeding the heating element that's on the back of the water heater. So on the heating element, that's gonna come from your circuit breaker. Sometimes they go through a convenient switch possibly, but on the Atwoods, it's not necessary because the convenient switch is kind of controlled in here. Um, so that means 12 volts can control the 120 volts when we're using a relay to kind of piggyback or leapfrog that voltage. A 12 volt switch is controlling a 120 volt circuit through a relay. Okay, so the 120 volts will pass through the relay when the 12 volt coil is energized. Hope all that makes sense to you. But all that happens on the back side of this. If you can gain access to the rear of your water heater and it's not working on electricity, then it's on the back side. What you're gonna do is you're gonna verify that you have 12 volts on this yellow wire leaving this control module. Again, you need your water heater to not be satisfied and calling for heat and you need to energize this white wire and then you're gonna look for 12 volts on your yellow wire. If you have 12 volts on your yellow wire, then the relay in the back should have made, okay, a relay is a magnet, it, you create an electromagnet, and that relay should have been made, and that allows 120 volts to pass through to heat your, your heating element. The customer is not complaining that the water heater does not work on AC, the customer on this instance is complaining that the water heater is not working on LP. So then what we're gonna do is we're gonna follow the trail coming in on the orange wire, and then we're gonna follow it through the orange wire. We're gonna make sure that that happens. If we do not have power on the orange wire when the switch is on on the inside, then the problem is not with the water heater, the problem's upstream. It could be a fuse, it could be the switch. And if that's the instance, a lot of times take the switch off the wall and just make sure you have 12 volts there. The problem you might run into is finding a ground and what you can do is you could take your meter and just find a receptacle and the ground plug, the big one on the bottom of the plug, usually it's on the bottom, um, that's your ground. You could use that as ground if you want. And, um, and then you reference ground to the switch, um, if that makes sense, to troubleshoot your switches. But you need to make sure you have 12 volts sitting on one side of the switch. So when you flip the switch, the 12 volts passes through the switch and makes it down this orange wire to here, okay? So let's test that. Um, now I've put this in the circuit because it was missing, okay? So whenever I'm looking on these things, I'm also doing like an emergency, uh, um, uh, what's the word, a safety assessment, making sure that all the pieces are there. So working on thing, these things is not only understanding theory of operation and what might or may not be 
the fault, but it's also knowing what's missing. And so if you're going to be working on these things, know that there's pieces that are supposed to be here. Okay. Also, we're not here to back flush this water heater, but I'm going to make a recommendation to the customer to back flush this water heater. I've got videos on that. Basically, you're going to take this off and, and hit it with a little wand and actively spray it. Another thing I'll notice is this looks like it's got an anode rod in it. Okay. This is an Atwood Dometic water heater and it's got an aluminum tank. So you don't necessarily need to have an anode rod on the aluminum tank, but on a suburban water heater, which is a metal cladded tank, it is absolutely required to have an anode rod on the suburban water heater, not necessary to have one on the Atwood water heater, okay? Um, so the spec for this plug, if it does not have the anode, now he has an anode in his, but if you do not have an anode rod, then the spec is a plastic plug. Atwood has a part number for that, but there's a plastic plug that goes on this, not steel, not brass, plastic. That's the spec for an Atwood Dometic water heater. So what we're going to do is we are going to follow the trail. Now the trail is going to follow this way. Um, we're going to come in, we're going to troubleshoot this on LP. The trail is going to come in on the orange wire. We expect it to come into the box. We expect it to leave on the brown wire. That means our, our DSI board is good. And we expect to follow it through this thermostat. We expect to come through the high, the, the, the high temperature fuse here. And we expect it to come back in the board on this lower brown wire. And then we expect it to come back out on the red wire. Again, watch my other video and I go through where all these wires go. And they may expect there to be 12 volts coming to this ECO, emergency cutoff, okay, is what we call that in the trades, is the ECO emergency cutoff. If this one on the right hand side is my thermostat, then this one is my emergency cutoff. Now the emergency cutoff is only on the gas side, okay? And he trips out at closer to 180 degrees. And so 12 volts on our red wire goes to the ECO and then goes to, through our gas valve. And the gas valve has a redundant solenoids, okay? There's two solenoids. If one solenoid is bad, it won't be enough to open the gas valve. Um, we've got another water heater video on that one. We're working on a Suburban. And uh, so I recommend going to watch that one. And I talk about the gas valve and on that video that one of the solenoids is bad. And we do a demonstration on how solenoids work on that video. So in the bubble above my head here, um, I'll make a link to the Suburban video and um, just kind of fast forward. It's towards the end of that video where we actually talk about the um, the gas solenoids and replacing them. We've also done a video on my furnace playlist. You could look on the furnace playlist and we've also replaced a solenoid on a furnace, very similar gas valves on that as well. Okay. So uh, at this point today, I think we've got like 90 videos and, and a lot of playlists and a lot of videos. So a lot of the stuff we're covering, you could find on some of our other videos as well. So with that, what I want to do is uh, I'm going to put my meter on um, continuity mode, okay? The beep mode is what a lot of people call it. And so on your meter, you're, you might see this indication for like a speaker or something. So when I'm on continuity mode, I'm going to touch the two leads together and I expect to get a beep, but it's not enough that I see a beep. I also want to look at my display. I want it to be as close to zero as possible. So let's see what happens. Okay, I got a beep and I'm looking at 0, .0 okay? I'm looking at 0, .0, okay? So that means that there is zero resistance when I touch these two leads together. So there's no resistance at all. It's almost like it, it's a continuous deal. Now, when I am in continuity mode and I say OL, that means open loop, I'm open, okay? This is closing. So when I come across resistance, then I might see 0.0, .0 on my meter, which means there's no resistance. Or if I'm reading something like a solenoid or a heating element or a heater element on a refrigerator, then I'm gonna be looking at ohms and I'm gonna be reading the amount of resistance going through that. So then I'm still in the same mode here, but instead of me seeing zero for a continuity test, I'm actually reading the ohms and that we could use Ohm's law and Watt's law to determine um, what that should be, okay? So on a side note, let's say a, a water heater, um, I just know that that's 10 ohms, okay? Um, what is that? Um, I'm not even gonna do the math because I'm not even thinking about doing math right now. But, but same mode on your meter with continuity or the ohms setting will give your value. So it's not enough just to hear the beep, you actually have to look at the gauge as well, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have Dakota here in just a second, go inside and turn on the gas valve, but not just yet. I want to check continuity through these um, thermostats here. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my right angled hook here and I'm going to pop these off 
thought I could cheat it and get back in behind there, but that's not going to allow me. And with this, I'm just kind of getting the fuse in there and rocking it off a little bit. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do, check my continuity. The meter's good. I'm going to check this here. And so this, I have zero resistance going through the thermostat. That means the thermostat is closed. So the water heater is cold and he wants to heat. Okay. So that's the first test. Um, so I know that that's good. And now I'm going to pop these off on the ECO side. Another thing I think we might do while we're here, I've got my box down here, is um, I've got these stickers, they're all of like a buck or something like that. I might put a new sticker on here just to clean it up a little bit. So another thing, these aren't that expensive. You could clean them up, clean up really good your adhesive and then put the sticker on there. So what I've done is I've pulled my wires off, okay? And now going back to the meter, I'm gonna just look at some continuity readings. And then here's my ECO. My ECO is closed, 0.0, .0 is my resistance on that. So ECO is satisfied and um, thermostat satisfied. Um, so with that, I'm gonna reconnect this. Orange is gonna go on this side. Red is gonna go on this side. I don't want him to be down low because that's where the flame is. I would really rather him be a little bit higher. So I'm gonna reorient the wire up to the top here. Okay, kind of in that area. Because this gets hot and then it gets hot down here. So let's try to get these wires up here a little ways. Okay, and then I want, uh, it doesn't really matter, but I want, you know, which one you go on because we're passing continuity through the um, thermostat. And here's one where I have my, I want him to grab a little tighter. Okay, so there we go on that. Okay, so I know, I'm convinced that I should get, if I go on a uh, gas mode, I should get 12 volts all the way over to this point at this right here, because I know that I've passed through here and I know that I've passed through here. So on my meter, I'm gonna take an alligator clip and I'm just gonna basically grab there because that's grounded from this wire up here. And I'll put my meter right there. Now I'm gonna go to DC mode and I'm gonna take a little prong right here. Okay, so I've just made my lead a little bit longer and I'm on DC mode. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna probe into this orange wire, okay? And I've got zero volts DC. Okay, Dakota, can you go please turn on the water heater to gas mode, please? And while he's doing that, what I expect to see is 12 volts show up on my meter. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna prove to me that I'm getting 12 volts to this location through the switch. Okay, and... Okay. I heard, I heard a click. Hey, Dakota, you've got it on AC. I need it on LP, gas. There we go, okay. So I heard a click and I heard this, there we go, it's working. So, um, wow, I fixed it. Um, so the customer said it did not work. Before we started the video, we did try it on gas and it did not work. And that's when Dakota and I decided, well, hey, let's make a video on this and kind of follow the trail. I didn't go into all the details because I knew I was gonna cover that in the video, but I'm wondering something here because he put it on AC. So I'm, I can tell you right now, I've got 13.1 volts on the DC, on the orange wire, which is gas. And, um, and it's heating on, on, um, on gas, I've got a nice thing. Now, another thing I want you to note is on your water heater, before you start playing with these things, make sure that there's water in the tank and you could just burp this real quick, which is what I, okay, there's a little water in there. So you would not wanna turn your water heater on on electric or LP if you had not verified that there's water in the tank. Um, okay. So why didn't it work last time and it did work this time? 
these are some of these weird intermittent problems that we run into. I'll mention one more thing, and that is um, this piece right here on your Atwood Dometic water heaters. You can adjust this, so if you're in high altitude and you need more oxygen to support your flame, then you would loosen this nut and open that, allowing more oxygen in. We're basically at sea level here, maybe 100 feet above sea level, so we've got it almost closed. And what we want is a nice pretty blue flame with, you don't want this thing sounding like a, like a jet engine, you know, because he's so just roaring with all this air coming into it. So that is a beautiful, beautiful blue flame. Hardly any yellow tips on it at all. Um, I doubt it was this, but um, maybe it just needed to be wiggled in, in the thermostat. Um, there's also a fuse on here, which we had already checked. That was the first thing I checked was this fuse. So. Um, Let's say I wanted to turn this off and cycle it again. Well, all I have to do is leave the switch on on the inside and then unplug this top plug because I've got 12 volts right here, but haven't I just basically effectively turned the switch off? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it off, I'm gonna turn it back on again, and I wanna make sure that he's gonna fire off. Worked right away. Now, if you're working on a water heater and you cannot get to the inside of it, this is for URB techs. Let's say that you're working, like right now we're here alone, the customer's not here, they're in Olympia, they're in doctor's appointments. They're gonna be coming up here tomorrow and they asked us to work on this. So when they come here tomorrow, their RV works. Um, but, um, so let's say you can't get into the RV to turn on the switch, doors locked or whatever. You could still work on your Atwood Dometic water heaters. Basically you would take 12 volts. I use my battery pack off my drill here. Like here's my little drill, 12 volt battery pack. I go with 12 volts. Um, and I've got a little jumper that I put on here and I can put 12 volts here. I ground one end of this. Okay, that's hot. I ground one end of the battery to metal and I get the plus side and I energize right into LP or right into electric. And, um, and then I'm able to make my water heater work that way without ever having to go inside. So that's the trick there. Let me check this and I'm a timer too, but um, Basically, I was expecting it to either be the ECO, the solenoids, or the control board. I was thinking that the trail was going to lead me to one of those three sources. Um, but with it working right now, I want to make sure it's going to fire off. Works perfectly. Now, another thing I'm listening, I'm listening for that tick, 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 tick sound. I want you to make sure you hear that. Okay, so let me take my lavalier and I'm gonna put my lavalier right up next to the tick, tick, tick sound. And I'm gonna talk about that for a second. So listen for the tick, tick, tick. Okay. So with that tick, 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 that is actually striking the arc like a spark plug. And if this would have kept doing that, let's say it fires off. So I think I'm going to just add value to the rest of this video. If you've watched me this far, I'll add a couple more tips and tricks, the things that you might find on your water heater. If I don't get the tick, 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 tick sound, let me do it this way. Let me I'm going to finish up my video, but let me tell you a couple things that I would have expected to have found. So let's say that we did this and it didn't work. How would I know that it was these solenoids? I would know that it was a solenoids if my 12 volts left this board on the red wire. Why red? Because red goes over to my ECO. If I had 12 volts on the red wire, then I know that my control board's good, okay? And as long as my ECO is closed, then I expect to get 12 volts on these two orange wires, don't I? And the two orange wires should feed inside of my solenoid valves, um, solenoid coils, actually. And then I would use Ohm's law to test my solenoids, and I believe they come in about 45 ohms or thereabouts. We could do Ohm's law to verify. And like I said on that other video, we found that one of the solenoids was bad. And if you're gonna replace one solenoid, you might as well replace both. So down in the description, down below, scroll down, all the way down into the description, and I will make a link on solenoids for the Atwood water heater, okay? Um, get them on our Amazon affiliate link for these valves. So that's how, if it was a solenoid valve, you would have followed the 12 volts, it's gonna come in on the orange wire, go through the board, go through the brown, come back in here, leave on the red, and go through the orange. And that's how you would have known that if I have 12 volts to this point, then it's going to either be the solenoid valves, but if the, if the coils, if the solenoids are good, then, then we're going to be looking at the gas valve. Okay. Um, 
Okay, now let's say that that tests out okay. The other thing is let's say that I have 12 volts here and my gas valve opens and I can smell gas, but I never hear the tick, 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 tick sound. Okay, because it could have been that, it, we could have gone that direction. So I'm smelling the gas. Actually, you're not smelling the gas, you're smelling the ethyl mercaptan in the gas. That's that rotten egg, skunky smell. So you're smelling that, but you're not hearing the tick, 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 tick sound. That's this black electrode wire. If the ceramic here is cracked, or water gets inside of that thing, it will not work very well. Um, you also want a gap. The gap should be about 3 16 to an eighth of an inch. There's gonna be a long electrode wire that sticks out, and I can see it on mine here. It's gonna be welded to this one side of it needs to be grounded, and the electrode wire is gonna hang out above it with a little crook on the end of it that should be about an eighth of an inch. And if you look, you'll see the spark sparking, okay? So let's say that we smelled our gas and everything was good going through our electrodes, but we did not, um, hear the ticking sound, um, then I would suspect this electrode wire, okay? Um, let's say we had our ticking and the thing just flamed out right away. So let's say we heard our ticking sound and then the water heater ignited and then it flamed back out again. Well, again, I would suspect the electrode, but more specifically, I would suspect the gap is not right. Um, if my gap is too great or my gap is too small or the gap is misaligned, then, then I'm not reading, the control board is not reading that there's a flame. Okay, um, the way that works is at, in the beginning, we shoot a small, or in, the, in the beginning, the electrode shoots an arc through the gap. And then he does that for no more than 6.8 seconds. Um, and then if he detects the flame, then he's gonna stop sparking. And then he kind of change hats, good cop, bad cop. And now what's going on through this wire right here, this electrode wire, is a very, very small milliamp current is going through this wire. Very, very small, very hard to detect. But he's jumping that gap. The one side's grounded and the other side's hooked over the top. And he's gonna jump that gap. The milliamp current is gonna jump the gap. Well, Darren, how does electricity jump the gap? Well, because there's carbon in my flame and we're using carbon in the flame as that current carrier, okay? So as long as there's a flame, there's carbon. And as long as there's carbon and my gap is an eighth of an inch, I can pass a current through that to ground. And that is how this board knows that I have a flame. If I run out of LP, then I run out of a flame, I lose my carbon, I can't make my jump, the board detects that and then shuts down the gas valve, okay? Um, so let's say that I have voltage on my orange wire, I read voltage through my thermostat, I added this guy and I read voltage on this brown wire coming back into the board, but I have no voltage coming out on my red wire at all. If that's the case, then it's the board that's bad because it's the board that should send power. It's basically, if I have power on my brown wire coming into the board, then I should have power on my red wire leaving the board, okay? So if, if power is coming into my board on the bottom plug right here, um, but nothing coming out on the red, then that tells us the board is bad, okay? And since these boards are potted with all this epoxy, there's really no serviceable parts, so you replace your board. If you're still under warranty, then go with the Dometic Part number, if you're out of warranty, then I'd recommend the Dinosaur UIB64 board. The Dinosaur UIB64 board comes with a three-year warranty, and if you're already out of warranty, then it allows you to get a new board. Uh, another benefit of the Dinosaur UIB64 board is it's got uh, status lights on it, red, yellow, and green, and they help you troubleshoot your problem. So, um, I'm gonna check this one more time. And um, like I said, I've got a lot more YouTube videos on our playlist. Um, fires off every time. So at this point, I'm not going to charge a customer anymore. I'm just going to do a check and advise on this. Um, we verified that everything's working well. We did sell them an $18 part, whoopie do. And, um, but uh, there's no point in replacing the board at this point because it's working fine. There's no place in replacing the ECO or the thermostat because they're all working fine at this time. And so what I do in an instance like this is I let the customer know we've diagnosed a problem and then if it starts to act up again, call us and I'm not gonna charge for another on-site service call because you already had me come out here once. But that would be, this is just for URB techs that are doing mobile service. I know I've got a lot of folks that are watching that are doing mobile service. This is just how I run my business. If you've already paid me to come out and diagnose this problem and I can't find anything wrong with this right now, then you're gonna pay me to come out and do a, a check and advise diagnosis. And, um, but there's no point in paying for parts. I'm not gonna be replacing parts on this. There's, it's working, there's no point in doing that. But uh, if the customer calls me in a day or two and says it's not working, then I come back out and then hopefully we cross our fingers, it's not working when I get here and then I can find that failed component, whether it's the board, the igniter, 
or the solenoids or the ECO or the thermostat. And these are all parts that I stock. A lot of people ask me what parts I stock. I don't stock water heaters, but I stock solenoids, I stock ECOs, I stock thermostats, I stock these little fuses right here. I do stock the Dinosaur UIB64 board. Um, I stock switches, I stock gas valves, and I do have one burn tube and I have pop-off valves and I have plastic plugs. So a bunch of little pieces, parts, all in my, actually it, it goes in a bin like this. Okay, these are great, and I don't know if you can see this, but this is how I organize my stuff. So in there, I've got more of these. These are little hooks for the doors. These are for suburban water heaters, DC and AC. This is a small orifice for a suburban. Um, a lot of times the suburbans will need these little plugs here. And then on the next compartment, we've got a bunch of solenoids. We've got new um, ECOs and thermostats. We've got electrodes here. Um, I've got switches for the Suburbans, uh, new gaskets. And uh, these, are, these are solenoids for Atwoods. These are solenoids for Suburbans. So just a little behind the scenes on how we organize things and what parts I would need because I have been getting some comments on, um, and then as you see, I put the stickers with the barcode in the front on what these things cost. And I've got a barcode reader that I just scan that and it goes onto our square invoice. So um, yeah, a lot of people have been asking me how I stock things and how we do that. So that would be considered your bonus on a little bit of parts that I stock for these things. So, well folks, there's not much more that I could add value to you on these Atwood Dometic water heaters. I do have a playlist you can watch where I go through maybe a little bit more and maybe talk about back flushing and I go into a little bit more on what the wires do. But um, if this was helpful, give us a thumb up. That really does help support us. Uh, subscribe to our channel. Um, if any of our videos do help, we have a Patreon channel. You can pay five bucks a month and just kind of show us some love, help us buy lavaliers and, and things like that. We've started a new series called 10 Minutes with a Tech where all the comments and questions, I'll read those, I'll review those. We've also got several people in the office that are doing that as well. And they'll capture some of those questions and we'll cover those on an, on an upcoming 10 Minutes with a Tech um, session, if you will. But uh, while we were moving the camera from there to here, we saw an eagle flying over. Um, I don't see him anymore, but I wanted to get the camera set up quickly to maybe show you an eagle flying around. But um, anyway, so happy campers say my every works. I want Dakota to say that. So happy campers say my every works. Let's do that. Happy campers say my every works. My every works. So thanks for watching. Happy trails to you and yours. Um, stay healthy, stay safe. And um, yeah. See you on the next video.